Let's talk about, uh, let me take this to politics for a second. Donald Trump, uh, you know, he's, he's up, he's down, but he's been one of the main stories, obviously, of the campaign. Sure. Uh, one of the things that he seems to be able to sell to conservatives, which I just fundamentally don't understand, is this sort of vilification of um, free trade, of, uh, 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 of uh, you know, vilifies, for example, China. They're screwing us. Yeah. They, the, the case he makes, and a lot of people will buy, yeah. they're screwing us. They're manipulating their uh, currency. <laughs> Uh, look at what they're doing to us. I'll win those battles. Yeah, yeah. The, the currency thing seems to really connect with people. People saying they're making cheap goods, stealing our jobs. Can you go through some of those arguments? Because yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to communicate. I it think, is to hard because it's it's this is this is economics, and economics is not not easy, and and people think they understand it when they don't. Look, I, I laugh when they talk about the currencies because I think it's the funniest thing ever. Mm. No government over the last eight years has manipulated its currency more than the United States government. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, no government in the world. Mm. We have kept interest rates at zero. Yeah. There is no economic <laughs> justification in the world for interest rates to be at zero. What is that? that that's the manipulating currency. Yeah. We printed $4 trillion. $4 trillion mm -hmm. of new cash. Mm -hmm. So when you have a central bank, by definition... By definition, you are manipulating the currency. One of the reasons I'm against the central bank, any mm -hmm. central bank. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, China is doing very similar to what, you know, we're doing. They, they went to the same Keynesian economic schools that our genius economists go to, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, they're suffering the consequences. Economic growth in China is plummeting because they're adopting more and more of our economic policies rather than adopting capitalism, which they were on the path to doing, mm -hmm. which is real freedom. So... Yes, you know, they've let their currency float, which Milton Friedman was a huge advocate for, letting currencies float. And as a consequence of it floating, everybody looked at China and looked at the United States and said, you know what, given what's happening in China, the dollar's worth more than the Chinese currency is. So the, so the, the, the Chinese currency went down 2%, mm. right? That's, now, <laughs> what's interesting and what nobody reports is the Chinese were buying their own currency like crazy to prevent it from collapsing. Mm. So the facts are even wrong that people are talking about. At the end of the day, um, you know, if the Chinese devalue their currency, if they let their currency plummet, who are they, who, who's going to suffer? Well, it's Chinese people. Yes, yeah, they're people. It's the Chinese people. Right. We, in America, will get cheap goods. Right. Yay! <laughs> Yay! That's cool. <laughs> Cheaper televisions. Maybe we'll get a Chinese car finally. Right? Our standard of living will actually go up. Right. And people say some people lose their jobs. Sure, some people lose their jobs. But if the currency plummets over there and we can now get cheaper goods, it means we're spending less on necessities. Mm -hmm. We can save more, invest more, create new businesses, which means more jobs for America. So a strong dollar, ideally a stable and strong dollar, is the ideal economic policy we could have. It means that we've got a thriving, engaged busy economy which is employing people so uh you know if we had a free market which we don't we don't completely in this country no or far from it in yes. this country unfortunately mm -hmm. so no th this is pure this goes back we were talking before the show this goes back to adam smith the wealth of nations i mean everybody you know 1776 the book comes out and this is the first book to articulate the case for trade what kind of trade people remember it as the book for capitalism yeah but the key point that adam smith is saying is that mercantilism the idea of manipulating trade doesn't work. The whole book is about free trade. The best thing the United States could do in terms of trade is none of these agreements, NAFTA, SHMAFTA, lower tariffs of goods coming into the United States to zero. Yeah. And you'll see the world will change. Everybody else will try to match us. You'll get free trade. Standard of living will almost automatically go up. And That's the best trade policy we could have instead of playing these games. It'll help us, and it'll help the world. I mean, it'll help no question. everybody. And I, I don't understand the whole the, the thing about Chinese manipula manipulating their currency. It's like we're arguing uh, for the right to overpay for goods. Yeah, but it's, it goes deeper than that. Look, it does. When it a does. country is in trouble, and I think America is in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, the soul of America is in trouble. There's something, you know, the psyche of America, if you will, is in trouble. You always look for the other to blame. Right. 
whether the other is 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 the other internally. I I think I think a big a big you know the viciousness the the aggression against immigrants today in America, illegal legal doesn't matter. I think it's driven by that, by that hatred of the other because we have to blame somebody for our problems. Mm. And I think this viciousness towards China, which crosses across, across America, by the way, immigration as well. Bernie Sanders is as antagonistic to immigration as Donald Trump is, mm-hmm. and they're both attacking China constantly. This is not a left-right issue. This is an issue of a country in trouble. When America is growing optimistic, positive, you know, confident in itself, we embrace the world. We invite people in, and we, 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 we want to trade with anybody. But when we're in trouble and we feel bad about ourselves, we start blaming. That's kind of a normal human reaction, um, but yeah, it's not a healthy one. It's not a healthy one. Mm-hmm. It usually leads to kind of, you know, more statism and, yeah. and actually is the, is the precursor to fascism often. Let me give you one more here. Uh, Ayn Rand apparently still releasing books. Uh, <laughs> this is pretty amazing. Yep. Um, so tell me about Ideal. Uh, and what, what is the, what's the message behind it? So Ideal was a play that she wrote in the 1930s, and it turns out that she wrote it first as a short novel and then uh, converted it into a play. We found the novel in the archives, hmm. and it was an opportunity, even though it's a very early novel, it's really her first, some of her first writing, uh, it was an opportunity to bring out a new Ayn Rand book, and it, you know, I, think, yeah. I think a lot of people are excited. The real theme is is individualism, it's, uh, it's standing by your values, it's what integrity actually means, integrity to greatness, integrity to... And you know, there's a theme in Ayn Rand, which is the, the great value of, of great people, of, of the extraordinary person, and, and the value we all get from somebody extraordinary being among us. And I think, I think Ideal is an early exemplar of, of, of that theme in Ayn Rand's writing. Very cool. Dr. Yarnbrook, uh, pleasure as always. My pleasure. Thanks for coming Thanks. on. Thank you.